Good morning. Welcome back. It is Thursday, April 30th, uh, the last day of April, as we talked about earlier today. And we will be reading chapter three of The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. I am reading from the, uh, the Young Readers edition, um, which is produced for high, early high school, middle school um, type audiences. So chapter three is called Discovering a Thing Called Science. As you recall, we uh, have learned about um, his past and how magic was a big deal. And then he kind of learned that it isn't all that true. And then um, he became friends with a dog and has learned to hunt a bit. And he was doing that with his dog some. The year I turned 13, I became aware that things in me were changing. Not only my body, but also my interests I was growing up. I stopped hunting as much and began hanging out more in the trading center with Jeffrey and Gilbert. We met other boys for Endless Rounds of Bowel, a popular Moncala game played with marbles on a long wooden board lined with holes. The object is to capture your opponent's front row and stop him from moving. Bowel requires strategy and quick thinking. I'll admit I was pretty good and often beat the other boys. This filled with me with joy since several of them had been the ones who benched me in soccer. If I couldn't have magic power, at least I had Bowel. Also around this time, Jeffrey and I started taking apart old radios to see what was inside. After a lot of trial and error, we began figuring out how they worked. Since we didn't have electricity or television, the radio was our only link to the world outside our village. The same was true in many other parts of Africa. In most places you go, whether it's deep in the forest or in the city, you'll see people listening to small portable radios at the time, Malawi had two stations called Radio 1 and Radio 2, both run by the government. In addition to giving us the news and sports, they also played Malawian reggae music and American rhythm and blues, along with Chichuewa gospel choirs and ser Sunday's church sermons. For the moment, I heard something come, sound coming out of the radio. As a boy, I wanted to know how it got there. When Jeffrey and I started cracking them open to investigate, it was like spying a secret world. Why are these wires different colors, I asked, and where do they all go? Hmm, so Jeffrey said, and how do they make it possible to hear Dolly Parton, who lives all the way in America? And how can Dolly Parton be singing on Radio 1 while Shadrach Wayne preaches on Radio 2? We had lots of questions, but no one seemed to have any answers, so I set out to find them myself. After cracking open every radio we could find, Jeffrey and I figured out some things. For instance, we discovered that white noise, the static shh, sound that when you hear between stations and most other functions originate from the circuit board. This is the biggest piece inside a radio and it contains all the little wires and bits of plastic. The ones that look like beans are called transistors and they control the power that moves from the radio into the speakers. I learned this by removing one and hearing the volume greatly reduce. Before long, people were bringing their broken radios and asking us to fix them. Our workshop was in Jeffrey's bedroom which was piled high with heaps of wires, circuit boards, motors, crack casings, and countless other pieces we'd collected. Just like our toy trucks, we relied heavily on recycled materials and lots of improvisation. The same applied to the tools we needed to fix the radios. For instance, we didn't have a proper soldering iron to melt, weld the metal pieces to the circuit boards. Instead, I took a thick piece of wire and heated it over the kitchen fire until it was red hot, then quickly used it to fuse the metal joints together. In order to tell what was broken in the radios, though, we needed a power source. We didn't have any money to buy new batteries, so Jeffrey and I started digging in the waste bins in the trading center, looking for ones that people had discarded. You're probably wondering how you can use a dead battery. Well, the trick is finding the right kind of dead battery. Batteries used in handheld radios are, are deader than dead, because these devices don't require lots of power, a lot of power, and drain the battery of every drop. The trick was to find batteries used in big cassette or CD players. Since they demand such high voltage, the battery would often fail before it was totally empty, leaving a few precious morsels of power. To test the battery, we would attach a wire to each end, the positive and negative, and connect those to a small flashlight bulb. The brighter the bulb, the stronger the battery. Next, we could crush a shake shake carton, making it good and flat, and roll it into a tube. Inside, we stacked the batteries with negative and positive ends facing the same direction. Then we ran wires from each end of the tube into the radio itself, attaching them to the positive and negative head, heads where the batteries normally go. Together, we stack, this stack of garbage was usually enough to power a radio, at least long enough to fix it. So we've seen that 
put this one. William and Jeffrey have taught themselves. They've learned to fix radios. Um, and they did that by just kind of taking it apart and looking at them and taking, doing different things to them to figure out what each little piece did. So go ahead and write that down while I continue. On weekends, Jeffrey and I spent our days in the workshop listening to music while we tinkered. If we were lucky enough to get a cassette player to fix, and if there was just enough juice in the batteries, Gilbert would let us borrow tapes by the Black Missionaries, our favorite local reggae band. Hey, turn it up. Yeah, for sure. When customers came to see us, they sometimes seemed surprised. I heard someone here fixes radios, one lady said, looking around. Yes, I answered, turning down the music. That would be me and my colleague, Mr. Jeffrey. What's the problem? But you're so young, she said. How can children be doing this kind of work? You mustn't down us, ma'am. Tell us the problem. I can't find the stations anymore. There's only static. Let's see. Hmm, yes. I think we can manage. You'll have it by before supper. Make it before six. It's Saturday. And I want to hear my theater dramas. Sure, sure. Often people stop by to give us compliments. Look at the little scientists, one man said. Then keep it up, boys, and one day you'll have a good job. At this point, I didn't know much about science or that. Uh, much of, or that you doing science could be a job, but I was becoming more and more curious about how things worked. For instance, how did petrol make a car's engine work? Why was this foul smelling liquid so important? Easy, I thought, I'll just ask someone with a car. In the training center, I began flagging down truck drivers. What makes this truck move, I asked them. How does it work? But no one could tell me. They just smile and shrug their shoulders. Really, how can you drive a truck and not know how it works. Even my father, who I thought knew everything, was stumped. The petrol burns and releases fire and, well, I'm not really sure. Compact disc players were just becoming popular in the air area and these things really fascinated me. I watched people insert the shiny little wheel, press a button, and suddenly hear music. How in the world, I wondered. How do they put songs on that disc, I'd ask. Who cares, the people, people would answer. My neighbors in the trading center seemed happy to enjoy their cards and CD players without explanation, but not me. I was filled with a desire to understand and the questions never stopped coming. If finding these answers was the job of a scientist, then I wanted to be one. Of all the things to be curious about, what intrigued me the most was dynamos. They looked like small metal bottles and attached to the wheel of a bicycle. I always seen them around Wimby, but never knew what they did. That is, until my father's friend rode up one evening with a headlamp shining from his handlebars. As soon as he jumped off, the light disappeared. Hey, what made the lamp go off? I asked. I didn't see him flip a switch or anything. The dynamo, he said. I stopped pedaling. I waited for him to go inside, then jumped on his bike to investigate. Sure enough, the light came on as soon as I started pedaling around the courtyard. I flipped the bike upside down and traced the wires from the headlamp all the way back to the tire, to the back tire, where the dynamo was attached. It had its own little metal wheel at the top that pressed against the rubber. When the tire spun, so did that wheel. There was, then there was light. I couldn't get this out of my head. How did a spinning metal wheel create light? The next time the man came to visit, I flipped the bike over for another look. This time I noticed the wires had come loose from the lamp. While the tire was spinning, I accidentally brushed the bare end of the wire against the metal handlebar and saw a spark. Aha, my first clue. I called over my trusted colleague, Mr. Jeffrey, Bamble, bring me one of our radios, I said. One that works. I'm in just onto something vague. Sure, sure. Just like with our battery test, I connected the two wires from the dynamo to the positive and negative heads in the radio where the batteries normally go. Okay, Jeffrey, now start pedaling. <clears throat> when Jeffrey spun the wheel, nothing happened. So I took the wires out of the radio and reattached them to the headlamp. When Jeffrey pedaled, the light flickered on. Mr. Jeffrey, my experiment shows that the dynamo and the bulb are, are both working properly. So why won't the radio play? Hmm, he said. Try sticking the wire somewhere else. He pointed to a little socket in the radio labeled AC. Try here, he said. Lo and behold, when I jammed the wires inside, the radio came to life. Tonga, we shouted. I pedaled the bicycle as Billy Kaunda sang his happy music on Radio 2. Jeffrey became so excited that he started to dance. Keep pedaling, he said. This is one of my favorite songs. Hey, but I want to dance too. Without realizing it, Jeffrey and I had discovered something called alternating and direct current. Of course, we wouldn't know its true meaning until much later, 
But while I was cranking the pedals so hard that my arm became tired, I kept wondering, what can, what can do the pedaling for me so that both of us could dance? Well, the answer was electricity. The dynamo had given me a small taste of this magical thing, and I soon became determined to try and make some of my own. Many of you have probably been saying, but doesn't everyone have electricity? It's true that most people in Europe and America are lucky to have lights whenever they want them. Plus things like air conditioning and microwave ovens. But in Africa, we're not so lucky. In fact, only about 8% of Malawians have electricity in their homes, and most of them live in the city. Not having electricity meant that I couldn't do anything at night. I couldn't read or finish my radio repairs. I couldn't do my homework or study for school. No watching television. It also meant that when I walked outside to the toilet, I couldn't see the big spiders or roaches that like to play in the latrine at night. I only felt them crunch under my bare feet. So the second thing that's of importance is that William has discovered a dynamo and kind of figured a little bit how they work. Um, so it's a new thing for him. He's figured out that they can create electricity with the bike and he's gonna be curious about it as it goes on. Whenever the sun went down, most people stopped what they were doing, brushed their teeth and went straight to bed. Not at 10 p.m. or even nine o'clock, but seven in the evening. Who goes to bed at seven in the evening? Well, most of Africa. The only lights we had were lanterns, but not the fancy kind that were powered by batteries. Our lanterns were made of empty powder milk cans, which we bent closed at the top and filled with kerosene. Our wick was a piece of old t-shirt, which we ripped into strips and soaked in the fuel. Kerosene looks a lot like gasoline and smells just as bad. Worse, it produced thick black smoke that irritated our eyes and throats and made us cough. But, and because most people's roofs were made from straw, the lanterns were a real fire hazard. Growing up, I heard many stories of people's homes burning down because someone knocked over a lantern. Electricity does exist in Malawi, but it's very expensive and hard to get at our house. Getting on the grid involves squeezing in the back of the old a pickup truck taxi and riding several hours to Lilongwe, the capital city, where there you would catch another bus to the offices of Electrical Electricity Supply Corporation of Malawi, ESCOM, and wait hours in study in a stuffy lobby until the sour face agent called your name. What do you want, they might ask. I would like electricity, you tell them. Hmm, we'll see what we can do. After you filled out an application and paid a lot of money, they would ask you to draw them a map of your village and house. That's me, you say, I live here. And if your application got approved, and if the workers were able to find your home, then you'd have to pay more money for them to install a pole and wires. Once you have electricity, you'd be very happy. You plug in your radio and dancing music, that is until ESCOM cut the power, which they did every week, usually at night. After all that money and trouble, you still find yourself going to bed at seven. Why does ESCOM turn off the power? Part of the reason is deforestation, which is a real problem in Malawi and other parts of the world. Thanks to the tobacco and ma maize estates, most of the lush green forests that once covered the country back in grandpa's youth are gone. The rest is being cut down and used as firewood. You see, since we don't have electricity, most Malawians, including our family, rely on fires for everything from cooking to heating bath water. The problem is that now the firewood is running low. It's so bad that sometimes my sisters have to walk several miles just to find a handful of wood to cut our, cook our breakfast. And if you ever built a campfire, you know that a handful of wood doesn't last very long. Without trees and forests covering the land, simple storms can turn into flash floods. Whenever it rains heavily, the water rushes through our farms and carries away the important soil and minerals that help plants grow. The soil plus a lot of plastic bags and other garbage washes into the Shire River where Escom produces all Malawi's electricity from turbines. The turbines get clogged with mud and garbage and have to be turned off and cleaned, which causes power cuts across the country and every Escom issue power cuts, they also lose money. This means they must raise prices to get their money back, making the cost of electricity higher and higher. So with no crops because of floods, and no electricity because of clogged rivers and high prices, people can continue to cut down trees for firewood. It's like that. One of the ESCOM power lines was connected to Gilbert's house, probably because his dad was the chief. The first time I went there as a boy, I couldn't believe I, what I saw. Gilbert walked into the living room, touched the wall, and, the, and a light came on. Just by touching the wall? Of course, now I know that he really flipped a light switch. But after that day, I started thinking, why can't I touch the wall and get light? Why am I always the one stuck in the dark searching for a match? I knew that bringing electricity to my village was going to take more than just a bicycle dynamo. 
or any wizard's best magic. In any way, my family couldn't afford to buy either of those things. But I did have one bit of hope. I would soon be taking my final exams to leave primary school. If I passed and advanced to secondary school, what kids in America call middle school, I knew I'd be studying more science. Several schools had special science programs where students got to work on all kinds of experiments. If I could get into one of those places, perhaps my dream of becoming a scientist would, become, would come true. My current school, Wimby Primary, certainly didn't seem like a place where scientists come from. It was lo located down the wooded trail from Gilbert's house, just opposite the mosque. It was a community school supported by the government, and the conditions were quite shabby. The iron sheets on the roof were full of holes, and when it rained, the water poured down on us. The rooms were small for the large numbers of students, and some classes were held outside under trees. With all the trucks going past, plus the birds, insects, and people walking around, it was impossible to concentrate. The administrators didn't provide us with lesson books of our own. The teachers always ran out of chalk, and most students never owned a pencil. <clears throat> Ask any child in Malawi to spell their name or give the sum of two times two, they probably scribble the answer in the dirt with their finger. <clears throat> Another problem at Wimby was where the toilets. Just a few grass huts with a deep hole covered with logs. It didn't take long for the termites to make their nests inside those logs and eat them hollow. One afternoon, they finally collapsed with my classmate Angela squatting atop them. Several hours passed before someone heard her crying from the slimy bottom and helped her out. She was so traumatized that we never saw her again. In order to graduate from Wimby Primary and advance to secondary school, I had to pass a test, and it was a hard test. The standard eight exam covered every subject and lasted for three whole days. For several months, I stayed awake past dark and studied beside the smoky lamp. I spent hours reading over my lessons in Chichewea, English, math, social studies, and agriculture, a subject that we all had to take because we were farmers. For the most part, my Chichewea lessons were easy, so I spent much, most of my time working on English, which I found very difficult. For agriculture, they wanted us to know things like how to tell if your animals were sick with infections, and if so, how to help cure them. Most kids already knew these kinds of things from the whole, from working with their fathers. But even still, I wanted to make sure my answers were perfect. I took the test in mid-September. For three torturous days, I bit my nails over equilateral triangles and circumferences. And whether ampral or iodine was the right kind of medicine for a chicken with blood in his poop. I was a bundle of nerves by the time I finished, but I felt confident. The only bad part was that, was that the grades wouldn't be announced for another three months, leaving me with a lot of time to worry. All right, we'll get our last note. William's taking, he takes his exam to go to secondary school, uh, basically like our middle school, as he said. And his goal, his hope is that when he goes there, by, by getting, passing the test, he will actually take more science class and be able to learn more about the science stuff he's interested in. So a little bit more, we'll finish the chapter while you write that down. Unlike in America, secondary school wasn't free. It costs money to attend, and because of that, most kids in Malawi didn't even bother going. My older sister, Annie, was already halfway finished with her schooling, and I couldn't wait to have my own chance. Another exciting thing about upper grades was getting a new uniform. Soon I could ditch the little boy shorts required for younger children and walk tall in trousers. Once my exam was over, I waited for Gilbert to finish. No more short pants for us, I said when he appeared. That's right. Until we start school again, our mornings are free. What shall we do? Let's get Kamba and go hunting, I said. It's been too long. Yeah, for sure. We were halfway home when Kamba met us on the trail, tail wagging as if he heard my every word. That afternoon, the three of us hunted for hours until the yellow sun sank behind the highlands. With our sacks full, we walked home under an orange dusk and made a great fire in the courtyard, cooked our birds, and ate like men. All right, that's the end of chapter three. So we will find out. Um, hopefully shortly if he passes the exam and if he'll get to go to secondary school.